Hurricane Ian making its second landfall this afternoon. Winds are 85 miles an hour as we record this, but those should start dropping through the evening hours. Welcome to another edition of Forecast Lab. We are watching Hurricane Ian coming on shore in the Carolinas. Not much precipitation compared to what we had two days ago, although the efficiency of the convection is still pretty high. So rainfall rates are up there and there is the risk of flash flooding still. And ahead and to the right of the track, we do have a severe thunderstorm and rotating supercell risk. And with that, tornado watches and a few tornado warnings in effect, mostly in North Carolina. One of the top stories this afternoon is, of course, the damage from Hurricane Ian in southwestern Florida. You probably remember when the storm was coming on shore, we had all those wind and surge clips, and it was hard to figure out where anything was. People don't do a very good job communicating where things are, what we're looking at, what direction, and so on. So that kind of reduces it down to entertainment. And that's also true when news crews are going around showing the damage afterwards. However, aerial damage surveys, those let us do a more systematic and scientific look at what happened. It's the next best thing to being on the ground. And I'm going to show you how to go about interpreting these images. And at the very end, I'll give you a link so you can check these images out for yourself. Now, there's a system operated by NOAA where these survey images are warehoused, and you can see there's not a whole lot of coverage. This does take time to build. However, a lot of the important areas are coming in, and we're going to check that out this afternoon. Now, first of all, before you go into these images, you should have a good idea when they were taken. You can go up to the top right of this website, which I'm going to show you in a minute. September 29th, that's when the first batch came in, and then today additional images along the barrier island. And for the time of day, just check out the sun shadows. You can see that the shadows are being cast to the east. So this is going to be about 6 or 7 p.m. And that's important for finding out how much cleanup has been done, because that does change the scenery as things progress, and you can see some cleanup going on right there. And in a few areas, you will find clusters of cars neatly put together. That's going to be the cleanup, the rescue, utility companies, owners, things like that. A good place to start is going to be a relatively isolated area, like right here along 867 near Shell Point Boulevard. That's close to the Sanibel Causeway. And what do we see here? You notice there's not too much debris south of this development, but look up to the north. Yep, those are boats and maybe pieces of metal here and there. Those have been driven to the northeast. If we go back through the wind data, we notice at uh, Fort Myers Airport, winds were out of the south-southwest around the time the station failed. That's the last observation we have right there. Winds were gusting up to 83 knots. And as we record this, there is a major data hole. Sometimes as the hurricane passes, you get strong winds coming back the other way. But I don't think that happened with this particular storm. And as a result, most of this debris was carried this way. So those boats are probably coming from some of these docks on the other shore. So you can use that principle to start looking around some of the other areas and we don't see a whole lot of debris being carried out into the marshes. The same with this area. Yeah, not very much being carried out of the developments. So this wind is not really catastrophic. And if we zoom in on some of the houses here, most of the roofs are intact. Not all of them. But I think a lot of these people really got lucky. So zooming in on Sanibel, there's the causeway. This is where we really start looking at things in detail. We start to look at shingled roofs, what kind of condition they're in, whether they're gone. For example, right here, this little house, I can't go in any further, but you do see some exposed rooms. So that house there did take some significant damage. We also look for trees 
that are bent and stripped. Looks like most of the vegetation is intact from what I can see. Some partial stripping of these trees. There's another partially lost roof right there. That's mostly shingles that are gone. Maybe a bit of decking. And we cross over to Fort Myers. And as we zoom in, well, what do we see here? Flooding. That looks like a street pattern that's underwater, maybe under about one or two feet. And these houses, these, uh, I think they're modular homes. I'm not 100% sure. But, yeah, lots of standing water. Not quite up to the house floor, but that's about one, maybe one or two feet of water. Looking at the causeway itself, we zoom in and, yeah, that's going to be a missing road section. There's the eastern side. You can see a collapsed deck right there. That's not going to be due to wind. That's going to be due to wave action. The ocean carries a massive amount of momentum, and that combined with the storm surge and the wind-driven waves, that can definitely result in a failure like what we see here. And you can see there's sand all over the place, significant erosion, and some of it carried onto this four-lane highway. Yeah, see, that's just about washed out or covered, one of the two. So we'll head into Cape Coral in this area here, and we look around. Here we have a lot of palm trees, and if you zoom in, they kind of look like they're leaning over. But you have to be careful about camera orientation. And the way we do that is we find a tall building, like here's a church. The building has a appearance of leaning over. It's not actually leaning. We're viewing it from the southwest. So everything in the image is going to look kind of skewed over that way. So this here, don't worry about which way it's pointing. You might have trees that look like they've fallen over, but that's not the case. So you can work through a neighborhood and kind of get a sense what's happening. And if you find any problematic areas like right here, what's going on here? Is that new construction going on or is that a failure, total failure? You can go to Google Street View. So you take note of your location, Southwest 20th Place, go up from El Dorado, building number one, two, three, four, five, six. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So those are probably buildings under construction. And if we drop the old street view thingy and look at the lots, yep, that's a vacant lot as of 2019. Back to Sanibel Island where most of the damage is, you might be looking around and find a house that looks like it's lost its roof. But once again, empty lot. So that's probably a house under construction. And in locations where the structure has failed, we go to Google Street View. You can look at the quality of the construction, the age of the building. And it was that part of the roof that failed. So I wonder if this little addition here weakened the roof structurally. Well, it's just speculation. You really need somebody like Tim Marshall to look at that damage. Tim Marshall, of course, former storm track editor, accomplished engineer. He helped designed this EF scale. Texas Tech is where a lot of this work was originally done. And keep in mind that this is a damage scale. You can see some examples of damage indicators here. And this gives you some great indicators to look at when you're assessing damage. Here's where this website is. It's the NOAA Emergency Response Imagery website. You just click on the storm and that'll take you to the images. And there's the URL. Now keep in mind, this is probably hosted on Amazon AWS, and it probably will not go down. But if you notice it gets hard to access, please leave it alone for a while, as government agencies and residents there may be trying to use it. And people want to see if their place is okay. So it's a small sacrifice to make. So anyway, that's the damage survey process, at least from aerial footage. And there it is. We just got the information post-tropical cyclone. So it's no longer a hurricane. The internal dynamics are changing, and it's already moving inland and gradually transitioning into a baroclinic system. So anyway, we'll take a look at that in a minute. 
on the model data and see where it's heading. The rest of the country, let's check that out. Well, the backside of Ian has brought down a lot of cold air, as we've mentioned back on Wednesday's webcast. Dew points in the 40s across much of the eastern U.S. and temperatures down into the 70s for high temperatures. Some of that cold air also reaching Texas. We've had some cool overnight lows near 50 in East Texas, but the afternoon temperatures have come up close to 80 because the sun angle is still up pretty high. In the Plain states, we've got return flow, a very meager return flow setting up there, mixed with some downslope conditions and a lee side trough in Colorado and New Mexico. Further out west, we have this frontal system moving out of the western U.S. Temperature is quite cool down in the 50s and 60s in Idaho. That's a big change from a couple weeks ago when we had 90s and 100s. And some of that cold air is all the way into the Great Basin area and central Rockies. Let's take a look up in Alaska. Continuing to cool down, and we're starting to see the first appearances of snow in the Brooks Range. Temperatures at Fairbanks at this hour, 44. And further up, the uh, Yukon River, I guess, 39, 37. So we are transitioning over to winter in that part of the continent. And up in the Canadian High Arctic, snow bands starting to appear. This is a large polar air mass. Temperatures in the 20s and 30s. It's not super cold. However, on the east side, a vast volume of very deep air coming south. You can see temperatures are only 30, only 30 degrees, even up in northern Baffin Island. However, it's strongly affecting the thickness field. You can see the 540 line is all the way down into Ontario with other lines stacked up all the way back into Hudson Bay. Typically around that 540 line, we should see temperatures about 30 degrees. But the fact that we're hanging on to that 30 degree temperature in northern Canada indicates that a lot of that thickness is coming from the vertical volume, not the actual cold temperatures. Some of that cold air spilling out into Quebec, driving that front into Labrador and the Maritimes, and coming back into the eastern U.S. High pressure, that's another, that's the most recent blob of cold air to come out of Canada, and temperatures, it's going to be a cool night up in that part of the country. Let's head straight to those forecast extremes. That's a great way to see what kind of crazy weather is coming. For today, 63 at Vera Beach, that's going to be a low temperature, and that breaks the record. It's all that cold air that's spilling down from the Great Lakes. That is going to be data for this morning. Looking at the actual METAR plots, they did get down to 64. I don't know if they reached 63, but 64 is enough to break the record. And look at that cold northwesterly flow, at least cold for Florida. Lots of areas down into the lower to mid-60s. For tomorrow, things are near seasonal normals. Yeah, tomorrow, October 1st. And it is going to be warm on the West Coast. Astoria, Oregon, tying the record at 78 degrees. For Sunday, the warm weather creeping into the Northwest, 83 at Olympia, Washington. For Monday, continued warm in the Seattle area, 80 degrees at Seattle. And a rather cold 28 degrees at Caribou in Maine. A repeat for Tuesday, 78 degrees at Olympia. Wednesday, looking normal across all of the country. Same story for Thursday. So we are going to be running very close to seasonal normals for next week. All right, let's take a look at that upper air chart sequence. This is the GFS forecast, and this is a good master solution to what's going to happen over the next 10 days. So starting out, we see kind of a light wind pattern across the U.S., the jet stream well up to the north. And then going into next week, we run the chart sequence forward, a little low across the Rockies, producing some showers in that area. And eventually that opens up and uh, heads up into the Dakotas. Now, what we see is a ridge developing on the west coast. And remember, we talked about that very warm weather in Astoria, Seattle. That's going to be associated with that ridge. 
And we're going to continue seeing those height rises on the West Coast, and that builds up that ridge around midweek. Meanwhile, strong trough. That's the axis right there, northwesterly flow. So we're going to dig out that trough. If you're heading up to Winnipeg, Fargo, Minneapolis, it's going to be cold around Wednesday or Thursday. That is a cold pattern and unsettled in the Great Lakes. And, of course, that digs further into the northeastern U.S. And by Friday and Saturday, it's going to be unsettled and cold in that part of the country. Meanwhile, out west, we've still got that ridge. And that's been kind of a, of a recurring theme the past five years. Ridge out west, trough out east. And we're seeing that again. Hopefully that's not going to be the dominant pattern this winter, but if it is, that's going to mean continued drought going into the spring and summer of next year. And meanwhile, plenty of rain and cold weather in the northeastern U.S. Now, we're not going to be locked into this pattern, but it could be a rather common thing that we see during the next few months. Don't know that for sure, but that's kind of what we've been looking at for the past couple years. And hopefully, this, you know, as I mentioned, this doesn't become a recurring theme. However, it is getting stormy out there in the Gulf of Alaska. Pretty good low out there. And that could bring some pretty high IVT values into British Columbia, Seattle, and maybe even into California around the 12th and 13th. That's something we're going to have to watch. But we do get into kind of a blocky pattern. You can see that Rex block. You can see this crazy ridge all the way up into the North Atlantic. So I don't think the products beyond 250 to 300 hours are going to be that. They're not going to really be that accurate. So we'll just kind of take it week by week and see what happens. And a last update for Ian, the circulation coming inland, moving clearly into North Carolina. We can use a convective allowing model to see what Ian's going to do tonight and tomorrow. Now, this is a 12Z model. We'll bring that up to the current time. And it looks like it's verifying pretty well with the center of the circulation. And you can see the extensive dry air advection flowing around the south and eastern part of the storm. A lot of the convective bands move into Virginia, West Virginia, and the northeastern U.S. during the morning hours tomorrow. And very little of it left by evening. But on Sunday... Northeast early flow will set up and we'll get that cold conveyor belt and eventually a little bit of convection will form in eastern Virginia on Sunday night. Some of you may have seen that drone footage from Greg back on Wednesday. You might have noticed some words in the corn and that's what it spells. So that'll do it for this edition of Forecast Lab. We're running up to 20 minutes and that's about as long as I want to make these videos. We'll see you back here again on Monday for our Patreon supporters and Wednesday for everybody else. Hope you have a great weekend. Take care and we'll see you in a few days. Bye-bye.